Hello and welcome to Straight Talk with Arun Kumar. Today's topic is about, as usual, politics. And my guest tonight is Assemblyman from the state of New Jersey, John Bramnick. Hello, John. How are you? Great to be with you. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for your time. John has been an Assemblyman for over staggering 16 years now, and he's also been a, a, a councilman for seven years. So John brings with him a lot of experience uh, to the field. What do you say, John? Well, I'll tell you, I've been the Republican leader since uh, 2012. And in New Jersey, uh, we've been in the minority since 2003. So I have a lot of experience being in the minority. I'd like to be in a majority. And I'm hopeful that after we do the map, the new map after the con- uh, census, that census. we'll be in the majority. But, it, you know, it's, it's always a struggle in New Jersey. You have to face the fact. Yeah, it's funny you speak about that. That was my first question. Do you ever, do you think New Jersey would ever be a red state in terms of yes. uh, state yes. elections? Well, if you look at the pendulum swings in politics, right? You've had Democratic governor for four years, then you have a Republican governor for eight years. Historically, if you look back, we've gone back and forth with governors. The difference in the legislature is that's a map that's created for 10 years. And if the map goes the wrong way, which it did 10 years ago, it's difficult to overcome that. But look at the presidential elections. You go from Obama to Trump. You go from Bush to Clinton. It's a pendulum. And pretty much that's how politics works. So, yes, I actually believe that a Republican wins statewide. And if we had the right map, we can win statewide. Yeah, but but that's the federal elections, national elections, right? New Jersey has has pretty pretty much been on the bluer side, if you will, for for, sure. for quite a long time. So Republicans have been facing a tough time to to shift the pendulum and this analogy to towards the red side. Uh, what do you think is stopping that from happening? Well, the gubernatorial elections, obviously, that's not true because we've had Republican governors. On the legislative sl- side, the you, have side. A prob- you have a problem with the map. We've lost the map twice. So that's 20 years of a bad map. If you had the right map, you sure we could win the legislature. But twice we lost the map. And when you lose the map, you lose the legislature because legislatures are gerrymandered. And when they're yep. gerrymandered, you, can't, you almost can't win. So, yes, there's more Democrats in the state, but there's a lot of independents in the state. Yeah, unaffiliated voters too. Yeah, uh, I agree gerrymandering is one aspect of it, but otherwise, don't you think that's reflecting the voter sentiment? Somehow Republicans were comparatively unable to get closer to the voter base as much as the, the Democrats did. Do you think well, that's think, of, think about this. Chris Christie won by 60% of the vote. And that's only, let's see, uh, six, seven years ago. And we lost the legislature. So you know the map has a significant effect on who's in the legislature. Otherwise, when a Republican candidate statewide can win by 60 percent, you can be assured that the Republicans can win the legislature. You just need districts that are fair and competitive. Right, right. Let's talk about elections, right? So well, since you're talking about it anyway. So what, what do you think is the chances of the Republican Party next year? next year the well, legisl- the legislative elections well you know that the democrats are trying to avoid redistricting they just have it they had a bill which was actually a constitutional amendment to keep the districts the same for another two years which would change the constitution if they are successful in doing that which i think is really unfair it's going to be a problem because this map as we've seen for 20 years, is just not competitive. So if they're able to change the Constitution, there's a problem. Right, right. Talking about bills, uh, I heard there's a bill uh, which got passed, which permits undocumented workers to get licenses in the state of New Jersey. Is that is that right? And what's your there were no there were no Republican votes for that. And here's why. If the federal government wants to change the immigration laws, then let's change them. But to change the law state by state and say that someone who's here illegally then now can have a license as a professional, like you got to have it one way or the other. I can understand why you want to change the immigration laws, because we do have millions of undocumented people, right? 
but you can't do it state by state because in essence you're saying you're violating federal law so that's why there were no republican votes for it it's absolutely I mean, zero law, right? either we respect the law or we don't i it's one or, it's one way or the other you can't you can't be in the middle in terms of respecting the law all right all right talking about elections what do you think the uh, money has a role to play in elections because Steve Sweeney's District 3 has been one of the most expensive races in the legislative history in the US, right? So what do you think money has to do with elections? Why is it getting more and more expensive year by year elections? Well, I remember Chris Christie used to say, the candidate's important and which way the wind is blowing is important. So if it's a democratic year or Republican year, candidates always the most important. Second would be which way the wind is blowing. Third is money. So, you know, if I get on TV and I can criticize and say something about you with $5 million, guess what? That becomes the facts. Money is a really big deal because you can paint a picture of your opponent. And that's really, that's really what people listen to. So if you hear over and over again that John Bram makes a crook, you go like this, you know, John Bram is your crook. So money's a big deal. Candidates, number one. And but it, if it is a Democratic district, heavy Democratic district in some of our urban centers, you can have all the money in the world on the Republican side. You're not changing the outcome. Yeah, I think with money, you could also change the narrative. Of, of course, because you think about it, there's so many different media outlets. Uh, people are into their own app so some people watch fox some people watch msnbc some people some people watch cbs so in order to get to people you have to spend money you have to get to the internet you have to do social media and it's very expensive uh last time they spent millions against me right. and i had to spend millions against them but if if they had spent millions against me and i only had a hundred thousand i probably would have lost everybody talks about this but nobody does nothing about it the high property taxes, right? What have you done or your party has done in your district or in general in the state of New Jersey to curb property taxes? Sure, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to limit state spending. So I've had a constitutional amendment, which I would love the Democrats to pass, which would cap state spending at 2%. Remember, Governor Murphy has, has raised uh, revenue, or should I say expenditures, by 11%. Towns, counties are capped at 2%. Unless you stop the spending, you cannot limit property tax. So let's assume you capped it at 2%. What would you do with the other 8%? You would give it back to the schools, you'd give it back to the municipalities. Uh, no question that there's enough money coming in at the state level up until the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Before that, they just spent whatever they had, as opposed to sending it back and reducing property taxes. So if you're going to continue to spend and you don't give money to the municipalities in the state, also in Florida, they have what's called homesteading. So I have a bill that says the following. Your property taxes are capped. They go up very little. Now, the new buyer, the young family with children, then property taxes will go up. But the new family that has children, new income, they're a growing family, that's what Florida does in other states. That's what we need here. So a senior citizen can stay in their house. And the new family that has the income can pay the higher property tax. But we can't do that until we stop spending at the state level. And that doesn't seem to be in the cards of the Democrats. So you've been winning nonstop since 2003. So what's the secret? Well, first, I think, being authentic, right? People can tell when they watch you on TV, they can tell whether you're real or not. They don't want to hear what the pollsters have told me to say. And that's why I get in trouble a little bit, as you know, because what they want you, and think about Donald Trump, and you know I'm not the biggest fan of Donald Trump, but he won because he's authentic. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question. <laughs> well, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk about him because of, you know, his interpersonal stuff. But here's the story. People can listen to you and they can tell you, is this guy giving me political speak or is he talking from his heart? 
people don't expect you to them to agree with everything you say, right? No, no one expects it, but they do want you to be honest. And I feel comfortable that I've pretty much been myself. I mean, I've had a couple of votes that, you know, I'm not that I've made some mistakes, but if you say you made a mistake, people go, all right, he seems okay. I like him. I think that's really part of it. They have to think you're real. They think, you're authentic, and they have to like you. I think that's number one. On that note, why does John Bramnick dislike President Donald Trump? Well, when I got in the legislature in 2003, I believed in civility, especially when we talk about other Republicans, right? Now, my first, my first allegiance is to New Jersey and to New Jersey voters. And as far as what I could see with President Trump, when he would say bad things about McCain or even Mitt Romney or President Bush, to me, to me, I respect most of my Republican Party. I don't like when we badmouth each other. And to me, the most important thing is we treat each other with respect. That part of his personality. Now, on the other side, we have a left-wing Democratic Party that will destroy the capitalistic system in this country. So it's not that I, don't, I endorse this crazy left-wing nonsense that I think has been a disaster in New Jersey. It's been a disaster nationally. I still feel comfortable saying we respect each other. We treat people with respect. We don't call each other names. I learned that in the second grade. So I'm not going to be a I'm not going to apologize for saying, look, I don't care who you are. I don't care if it's my son or the president of the United States. We treat people with respect. And you can argue without calling people names and making fun of people. I I don't like it. Simple as that. I I don't like making, he called Marco Rubio short. When he called people short, like, like, that's the part. Be respectful. Treat people with respect. I find most people are like that. And I'm never going to get over that. And people don't like that. Hey, so be it. What about the people on the other side of the fence? They call Donald Trump racist, fascist, and whatnot. A lot of things, right? I can't even say those on the show. Hey, I'm I'm the first one. I've been on the front lines as the Republican leader uh, challenging Murphy. I've been one, the first one to say AOC and the Democratic leadership doesn't talk about violence in the street. You've got people taking over courthouses. You have people that don't respect police. Antifa. That doesn't mean, look, I'm not part of a cult here, right? I'm part of a party. And if I see something in my party that I think is disrespectful, I'm going to say it. That doesn't mean I endorse the nonsense I see on the other side. But that's the truth. Are you, I mean, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not just a fan of the New York Giants. You go like this. I root for the Giants. I root for the Giants. I root for, I root for Republicans. If I, I'm the Republican leader in New Jersey. My, my first allegiance is to New Jersey and to the Republican Party in New Jersey. It's not to the National Republican Party. If I see something I don't like, I'm going to say it, period. All right. All right. Let's talk about, uh, when we talk about the 16 straight years, about 17th year, I guess, in, in, in the legislature. I looked at the voting percentages you received every time you, you ran for office. It's been constantly coming down if, if in the past decade. Uh, it started from 33%, went down to 29-ish uh, percentage, and then 26, and the latest elections, 20, about close to 26%. Oh, sure. The percentage has been coming down. Did you ever analyze as to why that's happening? Did you, did you know? <laughs> yeah, because there's more Democrats moving into my district. I mean, this I, I didn't do that well at Plainfield High School in math, but when there's more, I have more Democrats in my district now. Ten years ago, I had many more Republicans. And, and this last time, I had both sides running against me. So the truth of the matter is, you put more Democrats in any district, you get less votes. Simple as that. You know, like, you don't have to know about uh, algebra, trigonometry. That's it. Right. Why do you think, uh, historically, why do you think Democrats vote in higher numbers than Republicans? Why is that so? Well, recently, because of the mail-in vote. Okay. I have to tell you, the Democrats have been working on this. First, they passed mail-in voting a few years ago, and they work it. 
you know, a lot of Democrats in the legislature are on the public dole. If you look at who is in the legislature and what their job is, a lot of Democrats are basically relying on government. So they're going to work really hard to make sure that Democrats keep control. And a lot of that is mail-in voting, because historically, uh, Democrats went, to, I'm sorry, Republicans went to the polls. A lot of Democrats didn't in off your elections. Now they've got mail-in voting and Democrats go door to door. And they're good at it because that's their life. Are you in the gubernatorial notorial race for 2021? What, 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 where, is it, where does the interest lie? Are you interested in running for governor or you want to keep running for the House? Well, I'm going to make that decision in November. I'm serious, seriously looking at the race as governor. During my 18 years in the legislature and my seven years in an urban center as a Republican in Plainfield, I've learned a lot. And I know that you have to, and I watched Chris Christie do it. I served with Jim McGreevy. I served with John Corzine, Dick Cody, uh, and uh, Chris Christie, as well as uh, Governor Murphy. And I have to tell you, I've learned a lot on how to get things done. So I'm going to decide in November where I can bring those skills. Uh, and I feel as if, if I run, I can win. Because I think people think that, you know, I'm just not some, I'm not a crazy partisan. I'm never going to be. I run a law office. It's to, to get things done, to be successful. I built a law office, just me. Now I have 50 people, right? Uh, so I think I can get things done, but I'll make a determination right after November. And uh, as I said, I'm serious about it and we'll see. But, you know, I, br I bring a little uh, bring a little experience. Experience is good. And, you know, in any business, experience really good. Yeah, it matters. It does matter. Coming to the COVID situation, right? What's your take on how, how did Governor Murphy handle the current COVID situation? Do you think how would you rate him? Well, you know, his grade changes at, at, at the beginning, he was actually slow off the get go. Princeton sent all their kids home and yeah. Princeton University and yeah. the governor did nothing. Then the governor got into it. And for the first few weeks or month, actually, he did a pretty good job. And then what happened, he went into isolation, meaning that instead of engaging people, asking them about different regions like Cape May versus Bergen County, instead of bringing the legislature in, instead of having public hearings, he started to dictate things at 1 p.m. every day. I think that was a big mistake. So he went from, he started out at a D, he went to a B plus to an A minus, and then uh, he went back to the D. And at this point in time, he's not even talking to the Democrats. Now, understand this is a serious virus. Understand you have to control it. But look what Governor Cuomo did. In Long Island, in Sussex County, out towards Montauk, you can have dinner inside in limited situations. Upstate New York, you can. So I think his goal here is to lead the country in limited number of COVID cases. That's a laudable goal, but I think it's more complicated than that. So I think it's time for him to have open hearings, have everybody at the table, and listen to people who run a restaurant, listen to people who run a gymnasium, listen to an epidemiologist, but do it publicly. Don't go in the back room, come out, and then all of a sudden say, here's what we're doing. That's not America. That's right. That's right. So you think he could have handled better and be more uh, transparent about things? Absolutely. And, and if you've seen Steve Sweeney, president of the Senate, same yeah. thing. He said that. Loretta Weinberg came out the other day and said, you're hiding the statistics on how you're making a decision. That's a Democratic senator. Right. So this is not just me. He's not talking to Democrats either. You know, once you get on CNN, once you get on all these TV shows, you know, you start to feel your oats and you don't listen to anybody. I think it's a big mistake. And let me tell you something. Personally, I get along with the fellow, friendly enough guy. But I think in this, this is still an open society. In your about 17 years of your career, you must have sponsored or supported several bills in the House, right? What are some, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're proud of all of them, but what are you, some of your favorite bills which gave you that job satisfaction, if you know what I mean. You know, the, I'm going to talk about personal experiences because B-1 
bills are important, but when people call my office, and, and these and this one's a little tough to get out, but there was a little girl in Warren who had a heart attack and died. And I sponsored a bill to put these devices in every school and in every recreational department uh, in order that if someone has a heart attack, that they have the device, you know, there. And we finally got it done. And all of a sudden in the same school, they saved the young girl's life, right? right? And we went to the board of education and they brought the parents of the, the young girl who died with the parents of the girl who survived. It's that kind of legislation that changes you. And the other thing, there was a fellow who had late stage uh, cancer, prostate cancer. He couldn't get a drug called Provenge. And I called the insurance company and said, why won't you give him Provenge? He's still alive today, 10 years later. Sorry to so interrupt, you... John. Uh, we have a caller. Let me take Oh, this. sure. Yeah, okay. Hello. Welcome to Straight Talk. Hi. Uh, is it Arun? Yeah. You're live on Straight Talk. Yes, please go ahead. We have our I guest. Have... We have guest John yeah. Bramnick. Hey, John, can you hear the, uh, the caller? I, I can. Yes. Hey, you have a question for, the, for John? Yes. Hi, John. This is Vishal from how are you? Thanks for calling. Good, John. So I have a quick question. First is, the, I think that's the hot topic nowadays, about this driver license for illegals. And I just said that uh, New Jersey Assembly has passed it now. It's just waiting for the government to sign. And we all know that how there was any impact that can have. Uh, on our uh, illegal immigration you know, or legal immigration. So what's your take on that? How can, well, what can, as a Republican, you do about it now? Sure. You know, the law is clear. If the federal government wants to change the immigration laws, and I can understand we might need some changes, but state by state is a problem because once you open up the door, and we talked about this earlier in terms of professional licenses, uh, once you open the door and you say you can have a driver's license, you can have a professional license, then in essence, what you're saying, the immigration laws have no real effect. And I'm a big fan on the law. You want to change the law, let's change the law. But don't do it piecemeal state by state. And I spoke to Homeland Security secretaries, former Homeland Security secretaries, who are concerned about security risks when you start giving out licenses to people. So look, I believe that we should have some sort of path to citizenship. We should. You can't have millions of people here and no opportunity. I don't care if it's serving in the military. I don't care if they have to pay fines. You know, once you've been here for, you know, there are people who've been here for 20 years with their children. I'm not sending them back to some country that they don't know anything about. On the other hand, let's change the law in the federal system. Let's not do it piecemeal, state by state. And then you don't know. I mean, if you're going to have somebody give a license, but you're here illegally, how are you going to you're going to deport that person, but you're giving them a license? You know, I don't like inconsistency. And that's my problem with that. But don't you think this will promote the illegal immigration if all states doing, start doing like this, issuing licenses to the illegal can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah, so I think I think what Vishal is saying is uh, the, the the solution you proposed or your your, your comment you had would that not uh, promote uh, illegal immigration? Because if people keep getting licenses, no, think- I'm I'm a, I'm against all those licenses. I voted against all those licenses. Yep. I'm saying that at the federal level, the states cannot just give drivers licenses, professional licenses. No, I'm against all of that all of the legislation that gives a legal license or a legal professional license to someone who's here illegally. I, I voted against all of that. All I'm saying is the federal government has a responsibility to clean the mess up. And until they do that, I respect the federal law, meaning that you're either here legally or you're here illegally, period. But I was talking about a situation of Are you really going to send millions of people back to countries they haven't been in 20 years? I don't think even even Donald Trump's not doing that. 
Yeah, Vishal, just to repeat what yeah. we said earlier in the show, uh, we uh, uh, John mentioned that none of the Republicans, zero Republicans, voted for that bill. So all Republicans were against it. So j just so you know. Against it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, we're not. There, there's no support for that. And I just think that, you know, it, one of the problems with this two party system, especially in Washington. Uh, John, uh, uh, I think Vishal had one more question. Oh, sure. Go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Vishal. Go ahead. Could you repeat that? Yes, John. Sorry to interrupt you. Actually, I work with the law enforcement. I am also actually a police officer. I just want to know what's your take on like all this defund the police campaign and you know how it is putting our communities on this. First of all, defund the police. This is one of the reasons the left wing of the Democratic Party has taken over the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party 30 years ago, you know, when you think about downside, they were they worked with the working people. Now they want to defund police. I mean, it is so absurd. Do you actually think that defunding the police, look what's happening in New York City. They've had more murders in the first six months this year than they had all last year. You see people getting killed in Chicago. Do you think defund, I mean, defunding the police is the best thing that happened to the Republican Party? Because everyone knows the police are not the problem, okay? Criminals are the problem. We understand all of the issues with George Floyd. We understand that we have to respect all people in society. That doesn't mean we respect the criminals. So we're going to defund the police. Who's going to go out and take care of the bad guys? You know, who, who's coming out? Ghostbusters? Yeah. So, no, me, defunding the police is, it, in my that, judgment, the term itself is a disgrace. Right. To me, that, that sounds like an almost like an oxymoron. Defund and police. Oxymoron. You know, I, you know who would ever thought right. that in America, people say, uh, don't support the police. First of all, like, yeah, I growing up, remember, I'm in my 60s. Growing up, I I'm, if a police officer pulls me over with the light sign, I have to tell you, my heart sinks. And I think even though my mother passed away, I mean, I, 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 I can't even speak like uh, and what I mean is I respect authority. Simple, and I've never had a problem with the police. I know people have. But understand that uh, now there is one thing I do agree with, and that's community policing. For example, wherever you are, police should get out of the car and talk to people in the community. Right. I really believe that because I have seen, and this has nothing, this has been going on for years. Stop, talk. If you have time, go into an office, go into a retail store. When I grow in Plainfield, you know, the, the cop on the beat. Now we're not talking about, you know, cops who don't have time for this. Right. But talking to citizens is a, in Camden, we went with community policing, crime drop 80%. Yep. So we do need to engage with the community, but we don't need to defund police, that's for sure. Right. Michelle, you got the answers? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thank you for calling. So yeah, on, on that note, uh, I graduate. I, I can proudly say I graduated from the Citizens Police Academy myself. Uh, so it, it was an eye opener. Uh, always had respect for police. It just doubled up after that course. How much they do, what they do for us. So I don't know. I, I'm I'm deeply concerned that you know if you have someone who does something like the the police officer George Floyd, most police officers. They respect people. They respect the citizens. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sad that we've gotten to the point in our society where it's us versus them. Yep. And and I think that's a threat to democracy. Right. All right. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Let's finish that thought there about the bills you're talking about, the bills you're proud of. Sure. Uh, you're talking about setting up devices in schools. I think that's where we that's where we stopped. Yeah, well, I felt that the thing, as the Republican leader, sometimes my best bills actually don't get passed, right? Yeah. Because you, what, what happens in Trenton is when you come up with a good idea, the Democrats will take it. But I felt my, my biggest contribution was actually constituent services, helping people who, in my judgment, would, couldn't get the drugs they needed, 
the defibrillator bill in every school I'm really proud of. And I'm proud of the bills that reduce the estate, eliminate the estate tax in New Jersey. I work with Chris Christie on that. People moving to Florida, uh, reducing the estate tax was something that we did when Chris Christie was here. Anything we can do to reduce estate tax. We had arbitration caps at 2% to limit basically how much property taxes were going up in the state. Uh, that was clearly something we worked together with Governor Christie. Anything we can do to limit people's uh, t property taxes is what I focused on. All right. So I think that is all the time we have for tonight. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, and you. whatever you, whatever race you pick, governor or the lower house, we wish you all the very best on behalf of our TV channel. And any, any final comments? No, but, you know, I also do comedy and I need to do comedy because politics, you know, you need, a, you need some kind of outsourcing of your energy other than fighting with the Democrats. But thanks so much for having me. And I'd love to come back anytime you have time. Sure. Thank you very much. And to all our viewers, uh, John Bramnick is also a stand-up comedian, which is why. Well, you can go to funniestlawyerinnewjersey.com and you can watch his stuff. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure. God thank bless. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless America.